Now, after having finished the sections where we try to understand how Bitcoin works, it's time to take a step back. It's time to look into the history of digital money. And it turns out there are various predecessors of Bitcoin that add up to the foundations where Bitcoin was essentially built on. So we will talk about various systems that came before Bitcoin and some of these concepts will be quite familiar now that you understand how Bitcoin works. All right, let's get started. And we actually start in 1982 right here uh, with a proposal by David Chom, um, Digi Cash. Now the concern was that when you have electronic payments, then you have some traces. So when people pay electronically, obviously uh, this can be traced, this can be tracked, and this may generate this entire new data set uh, that could potentially be used by a malicious government, by somebody um, that wants to control it, uh, its citizens, for example, uh, maybe maybe really problematic under certain circumstances. So the concern was that there really isn't any privacy anymore, that your, all of your payments become uh, traceable and that this may generate this sensitive data set. So the goal of uh, David Chom by creating DigiCash was to create a virtual monetary unit that imitates the anonymity properties of cash. And this actually is a really important discussion because these days when people talk about anonymity, they usually uh, are really concerned and they, they state it as if it was something uh, really bad, but there are actually really, really important aspects of anonymity. Uh, there are valid reasons why you don't want all of your payments to be completely transparent, even if you're doing nothing wrong. Uh, and one of the main reasons, as I've said, is that um, from time to time it may happen that there is a government, that there, there are individuals in power um, that have certain tendencies towards uh, dictatorship, that have certain questionable motivations, uh, and it is much easier, of course, to defend power uh, when you can control a payment system when you have this data set at your disposal. So it, I think it's a valid concern, and I think that we have to be aware that anonymity is not necessarily something bad. There are uh, good reasons for it. And the way uh, David Chom wanted to achieve that uh, was by creating a system where you still have a centralized uh, money creation, so you'd still have a central bank, uh, so this would be monopol monopolized as in, in our current systems, but the big difference is that this mm, monopolistically created money cannot be traced. The central bank wouldn't have any idea of whom owns what, of which of these electronic payment instruments actually belong to whom. And the way this would have been done is by blind signatures. The idea was that basically when you're issuing uh, these digital currencies, um, let's say you want a 100 Swiss francs, let's go with that example, then you'd go to the central bank and you'd say, hey, I want 100 Swiss francs. You compensate them with other assets, with another currency. And the way it's issued is um, you're creating a certain number. Uh, let's go with a thousand of these encrypted packages. Um, you're supposed to add 100 Swiss francs in there, basically write it in there in this package. You encrypt it and then you send all of them to the, the central bank and the central bank then picks which ones of these packages you have to disclose. So they could say, for example, if our 1,000 um, 1, packages, they could say you have to disclose the following, mm, I don't know, 999, and then you have to provide the um, uh, keys that the central bank can actually decrypt these packages and see if you did in fact put 100 in there, so 100 Swiss francs. And if all of them are okay, they, they've chosen them randomly, they simply assume that in the last one, so in the 1,000th, that the one they haven't been able to decrypt, the one they didn't ask you for the keys, you, you, will, have, you will have put the same value in there, okay? Um, it's, it's a pure probabilistic game, and what they're doing then is they're signing this encrypted package, um, so they're signing it to central bank, giving it back to you, and you have the signed package, you can then thereafter uh, decrypt the contents without invalidating the central bank signature and then it can freely uh, be transferred to somebody else. The consensus is achieved by the central bank. It's basically a negative registry. Each of these nodes has a, um, has a certain identifier. Um, 
basically like a serial number and uh, when when this when this note when this bill this digital bill is used uh, it is sent to the central bank uh, they can cross it off in this negative registry in this negative ledger but the important thing is they don't know who actually has issued this bill so they don't know that this particular serial number belongs to you because they haven't been able to read that in the first place so it's really a concept of blind signatures is really the idea that the central bank the issuing entity uh, can not trace these bills they don't know to whom they belong so they don't know who has spent them and that's the big difference now they are not reusable once they have been spent um, they have to be destroyed um, they are all destroyed by uh, this entry in the negative registry and then the new person the person who's received this digital bill will be able to create a new one that was in 1982 in 1988 um, there's been a conference crypto 88 and uh, they Tim May presented the crypto anarchist manifesto and uh, you should read that I mean it's not that long it's really interesting when you think that this has been written in 1988 there's been quite some foresight in there essentially it talks about a lot of the problems that could arise and it also talks about cryptography as a solution as a potential solution to these problems and uh, how they can be employed and it's quite fascinating that somebody in 1988 uh, has presented at this conference and later on published it um, and uh, as i mentioned this amount of foresight this amount of of uh, ideas that have already been apparent in 1988 that play a really important role these days. In 1997, um, Adam Beck presented this idea of Hashcash. This actually is quite similar to the Torque and NAR paper we've talked about, uh, where they used uh, proof of work essentially, uh, so hash values to combat uh, chunk email. Similarly, uh, here the concept was that you can and create these hash values with specific characteristics so partial collisions uh, and use them as some form of a monetary unit some form of, of cash and here i really like this quote right here that this sums it up quite well uh, here we go the idea of using partial hashes is that they can be made of made arbitrarily expensive to compute by choosing the desired number of bits of collision so basically by choosing the threshold values in the bitcoin system and yet can be verified instantly because when you have a certain hash value of one um, then it can be verified quite easily um, because it's just the computation of one hash value of course so again just as with bitcoin this is trial and error approach but once you have a have a given solution it can be verified quite easily and um, the idea, as mentioned in an earlier lecture, um, was quite similar to the Quark and NAR paper. Uh, really a proof that when you're sending an email that you have expended some amount of resources for your privilege, uh, that you can do that, and uh, thereby combating spam emails or chunk email. B-Money has been proposed by uh, Wei Dai. Uh, it's been a thought experiment. It never has been implemented and uh, it relies on some strong assumptions for example uh, it relies on the existence of an untraceable network also it has never proposed a, a specific consensus algorithm so it just assumes that there is some decentralized bookkeeping but they came up with the idea that the sender and receiver use some cryptographic pseudonyms uh, so public keys so that they don't know who the other party is really the idea that you can stay completely anonymous but still engage in binding economic exchange you still can have binding contracts and uh wade i was really excited about this idea because he thought that this could essentially um, lead to a situation where we don't need government at least not to the extent that it is employed today because people could engage um, in trade without being at risk uh, of physical violence for example without being at risk of breach of contract once it is resolved on these uh, decentralized infrastructures now again uh, what was new really was the idea of the use of these public keys also the idea of the competitive money creation uh, through these numerical puzzles although you could argue that this already has been um, present in hashcash of course that's where it actually came from 
um, but there hasn't been a specific consensus algorithm proposed. Um, so it just assumed that there is this secure network, this untraceable network, and it also assumed that you have some form, um, some way that allows you to reach a consensus among these participants. In 2005, Hal Finney, actually we had two papers, uh, one by Hal Finney, one by Nick Sabo, a bit called, let's go with the Hal Finney one first, the reusable proof of work. And the idea was, it was really an extension of the, of the hash cache um, um, proposal. The idea was that you can reuse it. So usually with hash cache, when you're spending it, so when, when you have generated this proof of work and then you're spending it, um, once it has been used, it cannot be used again, and it cannot be transferred for these reasons. And with reusable proof of work, the idea was that you're creating basically a token um, based on these uh, hash values, based on the threshold, based on these collision probabilities. Um, so you prove that you have spent a certain amount of resources for the creation, and once it is out there, it can be transferred, it can be reused. Uh, it combines the ideas of Wei Dai, uh, and Adam Beck, because it also uses from the uh, way Dai paper the uh, public key crypto as the pseudonyms. So that you have your public key in the system basically as your identity. And of course, uh, from Adam Beck, the hash cache proposal right here, the proof of work. And the idea was that you have this reusable proof of work client that can create these uh, tokens by providing a proof of work string and signing with the private key. Actually, the signature wasn't done by the client, it wasn't done by the user, it was done by a, by a servo. So it was done by an entity um, with a secure computing environment that signed it. Um, they used hardware to an extent that it would allow you to verify that uh, the hardware or the uh, algo deployed on there hasn't been tampered with, and it would only accept proof of works that are actually legit. Uh, but of course, still there was some trust involved and you had this central entity that mapped these initial proof of works, these initial um, hash cash proofs basically to these reusable tokens that could be transferred. And then the client, when you want to transfer one of these tokens, you basically told that to the server and the server simply assigned it uh, to a new public key, so to somebody else. But the idea really was that these proof of works got created once and then they can be reused. And one of the um, core ideas of the goals behind that was mm, that Halfini said, usually when you have somebody who just sends out some spam mail, they have a lot of outgoing email, so they would still have to produce all of these proofs that they have expended the resources. But for the regular user who has approximately the same amount of outgoing and incoming email, um, it would be great if they could reuse the tokens they receive. So basically when you have an incoming email, then you receive the token and you can use that to send out the token later on, which may of course make the um, proof of works uh, may, may, may make it possible to make more expensive proof of works when they become reusable, which then again uh, may further make it more expensive for the spammer because they will never get any incoming ones. All right, so that was the idea of this reusable proof of works from Hal Finney. Um, you find on the Satoshi, uh, on the Nakamoto Institute. Uh, it's a great website that archives some of these protocols. Uh, you still find the code, you still find the paper, uh, and you can play around with it to see how it actually works. And with Nick Zabo, uh, the Bitcoin proposal, it's a, it's a combination of the proof of work algo and competitive money creation. And the idea really was that mm, you're creating uh, these proofs, you're creating these new non-fungible units. Uh, that also can be reused. However, there was one, one thing I already mentioned that it was non-fungible. Depending on the time when you have created your bit gold, it may have been harder or easier to do so. So uh, in this next sample proposal, it hasn't been yet solved uh, with, with the average and this, this more or less constant, but then over time decreasing money creation, as we see in Bitcoin, it really depended, the difficulty of creating new Bitcoin really depended uh, on the time when exactly you have employed your resources. 
And he even argued in the paper himself that in order to come up with a payment system on top of it, uh, this really was just like a reserve, the idea of a, a reserve asset, but to create a payment system on top of it, you would have to assemble, um, take, take various bit gold fragments uh, and assemble them in a way that you end up with approximately a fixed uh, amount. Uh, so, for example, you could take some of these Bitcoin units that are worth X amount, and then you can take some of them that are worth Y amount, and so on. And you have to make sure that the total value of these packages is approximately the same way anyway. you want to make them fungible. So it was really just this underlying protocol that would allow the creation of additional monetary units on top of it. Um, and as I said, it was even less fungible than Bitcoin is. Bitcoin, of course, also is to some extent non-fungible, although in many cases this treated as a fungible unit, but here with Bitgold, it definitely was non-fungible. Now you have to be really careful uh, because there have been other proposals and other projects that are also referred to as Bitgold. For example, there has been a Canadian uh, company a while ago, I think they closed down, but they also called themselves Bitgold. Uh, when it was just essentially just a centralized uh, gold custodian that issued a uh, completely centralized digital currency on top of it. And this has nothing to do with the Nick Zabo proposal that I've mentioned here. Uh, so you have to be careful also when you Google for that, when you're researching it, uh, that you find the right sources uh, and that you, that you are really looking into the Nick Zabo proposal uh, when you're reading about it. Here we have an interesting quote from the paper. Thus it would be very nice if there were a protocol whereby unfortunately costly bits could be created online with minimal dependence on trusted third parties and then securely stored, transferred and assayed with similar minimal trust. And that is Bitgold. That was his idea. And of course, Nick Zabo uh, was somewhat obsessed with the, or is somewhat still somewhat obsessed with the idea um, that you don't have to rely on anyone, that you don't have to rely on a government, that you don't have to trust anyone, that you really have this system that just works in absence of in absence of any centralized entity. All right, and then we are already in the year 2008 with Bitcoin, uh, but of course, what you have to be aware of, and that was really the entire motivation for this lecture, is that Bitcoin heavily relies on all of these projects that came before it builds on it, uses its foundations or their foundations. And I, to be honest, I, I doubt that Bitcoin would be uh, what it is today when you wouldn't have seen any of these projects before it. Uh, you can see the progression that actually led to Bitcoin. Now, one more thing, obviously innovation didn't suddenly hold in 2008. Um, there are, of course, many different projects that came after Bitcoin, some very interesting ones, like for example, Ethereum, a uh, smart contracts platform that we um, talk about in a, in a different class. I think we will also briefly touch it in, a, in a one, one of the videos in this, in this class, in the Bitcoin applications video, where we briefly go over smart contracts. But there is a dedicated class just for smart contracts protocols, uh, for smart contracts platforms like Ethereum. And um, of course, we also had, for example, the various Bitcoin forks uh, that occurred um, that haven't turned out to be that important. I mean, there is uh, today is no doubt which one is the real Bitcoin in terms of size of the community, in terms of the acceptance. But that's something we've experienced uh, with Bitcoin Cash, uh, Bitcoin Gold later on, uh, Bitcoin Satoshi Wishin, and uh, you name it. Uh, so that was something that was really interesting to see that all of these fear we've talked about in a, in a previous video actually was put into practice and how the market and everything reacted to it. And then, of course, there are other episodes, for example, in 2017, 2018, we had the ICO craze, the initial coin offering craze, where many companies, um, actually startups rather, issued tokens, issued to digital currencies for fundraising. Uh, then... In uh, 2020, the, the DeFi uh, spike where these decentralized finance applications uh, started really uh, to grow on the Ethereum blockchain. Then, of course, the CBDC, the central bank digital currencies we are going to talk about in a, in a later lecture with stable coins. So you have really this massive wave of innovation that came off the Bitcoin that split into various directions. So we're not only talking about decentralized digital assets, but also heavily centralized ones like CBDC. But what you have to be aware of once again, so the key takeaway uh, I'd say for this lecture is that there is some history. Um, Bitcoin didn't just emerge, it wasn't all new. 
I mean, obviously it builds on this literature and what is even more important is that it fostered this massive wave of innovation after Bitcoin. So with that, stay curious, see you soon.